hands on this. So I need to lean in, speak up. Good, good, okay. Good morning. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. This is a great crowd, especially on a Tuesday morning in the middle of the summer. I am so glad that you took time out of your day to join us. My name is Michelle Reed. I am the Open Education Librarian here at UTA Libraries. This presentation is co-sponsored by UTA Libraries and the Link Research Lab. Um, it's a presentation that I have been super excited about for many, many months. I hope you are too. Um, but before we, we get to that, no pressure, David. <laughs> before we get to that, I have some other exciting news that I want to share about the library. So um, last month, we launched a new grant program to support open education. We provide up to $5,000 for projects that further open education, and that can be adopting an existing OER, it can be creating a new OER, collaborating on an OER with people at other institutions, um, creating ancillary materials. It can also include implementing renewable assignments in your courses, and David's gonna talk a bit more about that during his presentation. So this was the first year we offered these grants. We saw a tremendous interest and had a really excellent pool of applications. Unfortunately, we couldn't fund all of them, but we are extremely excited about the four grants that we, we were able to offer. So I wanna tell you a little about what that work will look like and who is leading each one. I'm looking for our grant recipients. Um, so in civil engineering, we have Dr. Sharari Carmen Shashi. She told me I can call her Sherry. <laughs> I wanted to try to get that out there. Um, she will be creating a web-based interactive educational system to replace a high-cost textbook in civil engineering 5350, which is a risk management class. The course draws a high number of international students here at UTA. So um, she's working on that and she's viewing that as kind of a seed project for something larger that involves multiple institutions down the road. Our second grant went to Alicia Swade from Modern Languages. She will be creating an intermediate level French textbook that will be used in bridge course that prepares students for upper level French courses here at UTA. Unfortunately, Alicia couldn't join us today because she is in Paris. <laughs> Unfortunately, in Paris. Um, teaching and taking pictures for her new textbook. From the College of Education, I know he's here somewhere, we have Dr. Mohan Pant, there you are. Um, if you want to stand up for a minute. <laughs> Mohan. Mohan received a, a grant to create a textbook that teaches educators how to use statistical software. The text will focus on R and R Commander, and we'll introduce the concepts behind statistical analysis in education. And finally, is Brett here? Oh, there you are. Hello. Welcome. You want to stand? <laughs> our, fourth, our fourth grant recipient is Brett Lathwell in sociology. Brett, in addition to being one of our grant recipients this year, is also one of our textbook heroes. So we have a new cohort of textbook heroes. Uh, Brett adopted an OER in his sociology courses in the spring. He wasn't entirely satisfied with that, so he and I worked together to find an alternate resource, another OER, and some ancillary materials. He is using the grant funding to create additional supplementary materials to complement that text. So that will be um, interviews with subject experts, podcasts, videos, He's also interested in researching OER, so we are thrilled to be excited, uh, thrilled to be working with Brett on this project. Congratulations. Can we get a round of applause for all of our uh, So Dr. David Wiley is a Chief Academic Officer at Lumen Learning, and Lumen Learning is an organization that's dedicated to increasing student success, um, reinvigorate pedagogy and innovate pedagogy, and to improve the affordability of education through OER. Uh, he's currently a fellow at Creative Commons, and uh, he also teaches at BYU. Um, he has numerous accolades, including an SF Career Grant, and is a fellow at many other institutions. And we're very excited to have you here, David, and uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you. And first, let me say it's awesome what's going on here in the library. The grant recipients, good job. You future grant recipients, future good job <laughs> to you. Um, so my 
uh, kind of assignment today is to talk to you about the influence <coughs> of open on pedagogy. And I'm really excited for the opportunity uh, to do that. Um, these slides are open educational resources. I'll say more about what that means in a minute if, if, if that's not clear to you. And also, Justin said a word about Lumen, so maybe my one slide of Lumen, maybe the, the two or three things I'll point out is just that Lumen really has a focus on at-risk students and the, the faculty who serve them, um, trying to make OER use simple and effective. And uh, last year, you know, we saved students about $10 million. We'll save students about $15 million this year. Um, when you talk about open educational resources, you have to deal with the word open. Uh, the word open gets used so many different ways, and particularly the, the kind of stronger and more positive the brand around open comes, the more people try to glom onto it in ways that, um, th that are not the ways that the community uses the word open. And so I, I think it's worth, uh, if this were a dissertation defense, maybe just taking a few moments to define terms before we move on and talk about when when, when I say open educational resources, what do I mean specifically by the word open in open educational resources? Because it's going to impact the rest of the talk. So let's get clear on terms. Um, the, the first thing I want to say is I, I, think there's some, I think there's broad confusion that open is just another word for free. And I, I want to suggest to you that that is not true because the entire internet is already free. I don't pay to watch videos on YouTube. I don't pay to read the news on CNN. I don't pay to find recipes that I fail to make on Pinterest, <laughs> right? All, all of those things are already free. And if you don't follow the nailed it hashtag, I have to encourage you to do that. There's some really, people try to make the things they see on Pinterest and they totally fail and they take pictures and tag it, uh, nailed it. That's really funny. Um, Anyway, the whole internet's already free, so if, if when we talked about open educational resources, all we were talking about was free resources, we wouldn't need another fancy name. We would just say they're online resources. When we talk about open educational resources, we, we mean resources that are free and come with permission to engage in a set of activities that uh, we lovingly refer to as the 5R activities. And if you if you don't have permission to engage in these five activities with regard to an educational resource, that resource might be really effective, it might be really awesome in some other way, it might be interactive, it might be engaging, but if you don't have permission to engage in these five activities with regard to the resource, it's not appropriate to call it an open educational resource. It can still be good, it can still be helpful and useful, but when we say open, we mean resources that are licensed in such a way that they provide you permission to engage in these five activities. So the first is retain, and by retain I mean uh, kind of good old-fashioned ownership of private property. I download a copy that belongs to me that I can own and keep forever. It doesn't time out after six months. It doesn't have uh, access code that expires. It doesn't delete itself off of my Kindle at the end of the semester. It's a copy that I make and I own and I control. And then with that copy, I'm able to do several things. I can take it and just reuse it verbatim, just the way I downloaded it. Um, I can open it up and make changes to it. Maybe I need to translate it into Spanish. Maybe I need to take out the kind of quirky examples from Utah that are culturally inappropriate for your students in Texas and you want to pull out all the case studies and you want to put in new case studies that will speak more directly to your students. So those kinds of adaptations are, um, hopefully you will engage in some kind of remix activities. Instead of finding one OER and kind of picking it up as a slab of content and adopting it whole, you'll find some videos and you'll find some simulations and you'll find some other activities and you'll bring those all together in a way uh, that is this idea of remix, combining different resources into a single resource. And then also redistributing. So. So whether you're talking about, uh, whether we're talking about that verbatim copy that you downloaded in the, fir the first time, or your revised, adapted, improved copy, or the remix that you've created, in addition to having permission to engage in each of those activities, you have to have permission to take whatever the end result of that is and put it back out on the public internet where anybody else can come, download it for free, and kind of carry the, the virtuous cycle onward. So just let me pause for a minute 
And let's, let, let's talk about this definition because if we're not clear on, on what we mean here, the rest, of the, the rest of the talk probably doesn't make sense. So questions about, about the five R's? Clear as mud, huh? Okay. Very good. Oh, that almost prompted me to make a comment about the humidity that you have here. You, you have humidity here. You, you might not realize it. We don't have humidity in Utah where we're high mountain desert. Um, so in as much as we're talking about permission to engage in activities, and you know, if you think, why, why do I need permission to do these things? You need copyright permissions to do these things, right? Copyright prohibits you from just making all the copies you want and giving them away to other people for free or uh, making a film based on a novel, making an adaptation, or re copyright is what, uh, is what, generally speaking, keeps us from engaging in these activities. And so the way that you receive permission to engage in these activities is typically via a Creative Commons license. Now, by show of hands, how many folks in here have at least heard of Creative Commons? Wow, many of you. Perfect. Great. So then the very short version is that Creative Commons is an organization that creates copyright licenses that they make freely available to you, that you as the copyright holder, the creator of a video or an essay or a textbook, you can take that li license and apply it to the thing you've created, and that tells the world, world, I hereby grant you permission to engage in all these activities. Please don't email me to ask if it's okay. Please don't call to ask if it's okay. By means of this license, I'm telling you, you have permission to engage in these activities. I, I can't tell you <clears throat> how frequently I get contacted by people for works that are clearly marked as having a Creative Commons license asking me if it's okay for them to engage in one of these. Like, like, can we republish this thing you wrote over here? Oh my gosh, the whole reason of putting a Creative Commons license on it is to take this friction out of that process so you don't have to find my email address and then wait for me to respond to your email. I'm not the best responder to email. as. Michelle can attest sometimes. Um, I'm telling you, you have permission. You know, go out into the world and engage in these activities. So when I say open, when you hear the word open in this context of open education, um, I hope that you will think, when you hear the word open, free plus permissions. Things can be free and not come with permissions, and that, that, that leads us somewhere else. Now, I, I, I wish I could take credit for this term. This is not my term. Fopen, or fake open. And with fake open, what we mean are things that are available to you for free, uh, but with gated access typically, where you have to give up some personal information, you have to give up your email address, you have to give up a zip code, you have to penetrate some barrier to get your free access to this thing. And in addition to not giving you the five R's but being all rights reserved, frequently the website will have some kind of terms of use that puts additional rest restrictions on you beyond the kinds of restrictions that copyright is capable of placing on you. Uh, we might say draconian terms of use. If you've read the Coursera terms of use recently, they're a great example of that. Um, so I, you know, I know I have to be careful when speaking in the library not to be struck by lightning when I show you this slide, but if you think about the way that students experience the cost of resources and the kinds of permissions that are available to them, clearly with traditional textbooks, those are very expensive and they come without any permissions at all. I can't photocopy it, I can't, well, I'm not supposed to photocopy it or put it on BitTorrent or do all those kinds of things. Uh, you know, they're expensive and I have no permissions. Um, either the web or most MOOCs or even library resources, students' experience of those is that they're free because there's a fee that gets paid somewhere, but I just walk into the library and use resources any way I want. But those resources are always fully copyrighted, generally, generally speaking, are fully copyrighted, and don't grant me those permissions. It's only when you get into the context of open educational resources that you finally get around to dealing with resources that are free and that grant you permission to engage in these activities. So I'm not talking about the rest of the day today. I'm not talking about commercial textbooks. I'm not talking about the web. I'm not talking about the library. I'm talking about OER. Um, just very quickly, I think if, you're, if you've never seen an OER and you wonder what one looks like, I've done a little wildlife photography for you here, kind of captured in their natural habitat. Um, up in the top right hand corner, I've got the OpenStax logo here. This is from an uh, OER, an openly licensed 
a textbook on biology, you can see there are words, there are diagrams. It looks like a typical textbook might look. It just has a Creative Commons license applied to it, which means you can make all the copies of it you want. You can pull pieces out, put new pieces in, revise it as you need to. There are simulations that are licensed this way. This set of simulations is from the FET collection. You can see their logo down at the bottom right here. Uh, this is from the University of Colorado, started by a Nobel Prize winning physicist, where they create a range of simulations and then make them available under a Creative Commons license, which gives you all those permissions. I expect most of you have run into Khan Academy at some point, so there are video that are OER, and again, the way they become OER is by being licensed under a Creative Commons license, so you have those permissions to engage in those activities with this video. Maybe you want to dub a new language over top of it, maybe you just want to pull the 47 seconds out that you need and use uh, you know, that selection in a certain way. And there are even assessment items, uh, like self-check kind of uh, formative assessments that are openly licensed. So it's not purely content, but also assessment approaches that, that have these open licenses applied to them. So, uh, you know, assessment gets us kind of into the, the topic of the day. And this is, um, Michelle mentioned renewable assignments. I have, I have, so I was, what, 12, 13 years as a, either tenure track or tenured faculty member before I made the switch to being an adjunct, which ponder seriously before you do that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I left a place not only where I had tenure and a retirement plan, I had a pension in addition to my retirement plan. But, oh well. Um, but, but anyway, as, as a faculty member, I was always interested in this idea that most of the work that we ask students to do um, really is disposable. And by, a, by a, a disposable assignment, I mean a piece of work where everyone involved in that work understands that its ultimate destiny is the garbage can. Or in the, in the best case scenario, the recycle bin. Right? So I, I'm going to ask you to write this essay or do this piece of work. You're going to give it to me or maybe to the TA. Uh, one of us will grade 100 of those while we watch football or mm -hmm. something else. Then I'm going to hand it back to you. You're not even going to look at the feedback I wrote. You're just going to check the score, and it's going to go straight in the bin. And there's this cycle that we're engaged in where students do this work, we grade this work, this work gets thrown away. And it, it's not that that work doesn't support learning. That's not the criticism of it being disposable. The, the criticism of it being disposable is just that there's so much of this work that gets done that then gets thrown away. If we thought a little differently about our assessment strategies, might there be a way for all of that work to create a little more kind of value in the world? It's easy to forget, I, um, you know, I've been guilty of it, that students are people. <laughs> and um, right, it's kind of a revelatory statement, right? And, and people like to feel like their work matters. And one of the most kind of soul-crushing, dispiriting things that can happen to you, for example, is to be put on a committee uh, where you have this feeling that you're going to work and work and work and absolutely nothing is going to come of it. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that our students have those thoughts explicitly in the front of their minds because they've probably never experienced anything else other than work that, that they did and then threw away. But I, I think there's some interesting opportunities for us here. Um, in, in as much as I, I know that you guys are interested in OER because you're here and you have this great uh, grant program running in the library, this is something that you care about. Um, as we think about the future of OER, I think our current model for producing kind of large-scale OER is really unsustainable. If you look at, um, at Rice University's OpenStax project that I mentioned a minute ago, they spend between a half million dollars and a million dollars on each individual textbook they create. We just can't create the 2,000, 3,000 textbooks that we need for there to be OER available for every course uh, when it costs that much and, and takes two years to produce. That's, that's not a model that I think we can sustain over the long term. And I've already mentioned you know, this, this idea that there's about 40 million hours of student work I think that's done each year that gets thrown away. So, a question that has become really interesting to me is, is it possible for students to create OER? Uh, and particularly, is it possible for them engaging in that process of creating OER to support their own learning 
and maybe even to support the learning of others down the road. And that's really what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. So, you know, that requires thinking about engaging with our students in some different ways, asking them to do different things, changing the ways that we teach and the ways that we assess. Um, so, you know, how is it that this notion of open might influence pedagogy? What's the relationship between copyright or between permissions and pedagogy? And I think, I think it's this kind of five-part formula here. I, I think everyone broadly agrees, although maybe, I mean, we're academics, we could argue about it probably, but everybody, I think, agrees that people learn by doing. We learn by the things we do. It's, uh, it's completely clear that the function of copyright is to restrict what we're permitted to do, unless we go pay you know, royalties and seek licenses and things like that. But if we learn by the things we do and copyright restricts what we're able to do, then that has to mean that copyright uh, prohibits us from learning in certain ways. And now, kind of, you grow up with a certain type of pedagogy that you're used to, and it's probably kind of hard to see what that looks like. But in as much as open removes those restrictions and gives us permission to engage in new activities that we weren't kind of permitted to engage in before, that probably means that open create some new ways for us to learn, ways that weren't uh, open to us, as it were, before. So I want to explore that a little bit. Um, and I think it's really most useful to have this conversation, so I'm, I'm going to give a little example here. In the context of just being thoughtful and reflecting on your own pedagogical approach, <coughs> and in the context of your particular pedagogical approach, how is it, if at all, that open can be a lever that can let you do different things. So I, I happen to be a big fan of this notion of constructionist pedagogy, uh, Seymour Papert's uh, from MIT's work. And I'm not going to violate the first rule of PowerPoint by reading these quotes to you. I'm just going to pause and let you read them yourself. I have two quotes from Papert I want to share with you. So that's the first, and here's the second. And this is work going back to the 60s. This isn't particularly recent work. Um, but I do think there's, a, I do think there's a, a nice kind of way of thinking about this where, you know, e even in the context of disposable assignments, we're asking the students to create some kind of artifact. They're, they're writing an essay or they're, whatever it is that, uh, that we're asking them to do, to, to do a lab and write a lab report. Um, they, they create an artifact in that, in that context. I think in what are generally referred to as authentic uh, assessments, that artifact has some kind of personal meaning for the student. Uh, in Papert's view, uh, a constructionist assessment is one where you create an artifact that has some meaning to you, and the goal, you, you are aware at the outset that whatever it is you create is going to be shared publicly, at least within the classroom publicly, if not with the broader public. Um, but I, I contrast disposable assessments with renewable assessments, uh, where all those things happen, and that final artifact is actually shared by the student under an open license, so that it becomes something that later students or later faculty can build on and extend and work with. So it kind of changes, you know, a lot of times the rhetoric at the university is that we want students to be co-creators of knowledge. We don't just want to treat them as empty receptacles that we pop their head open and we, you know, this is the Freire's banking model of education. We pour knowledge in and then make sure the lid closes tight and, and send them out. We want students to be engaged in doing and, and creating. Um, so we say that. We, we say that we want students to be participants in the co-creation of knowledge and new knowledge. Um, and yet, a lot of the, the pedagogical materials that we give them are kind of under glass in a way that they can't really, you can look but not touch. Um, so so we, it's we're, this move of changing students from just being consumers to also being creators, I think, is interesting. That's, that's the Papert move, right? I, I think the, the piece that open adds to that is changing them from being creators to being enablers. The artifacts that they create are things that other people can take and build on and extend and further improve. That seems interesting. So I want to spend a fair amount of time just showing you and talking you through some examples of, of what this looks like and how this works. Because 
I think it's one of those things that kind of runs counter to a whole life of experience. And so without seeing clear examples, I think it's kind of hard to grok. So let me start with an example from uh, medical school at uh, UC San Francisco. Uh, and I'm actually going to flip over here and show it to you. I bigify this a bit. Does that become somewhat readable? Mm -hmm. So this is a class at UCSF, um, an elective course for medical students where the, the whole goal of the course is to improve the quality of uh, the quality and accuracy of information in Wikipedia on public health topics. Uh, so if you go to the doctor and the doctor says we're diabetes to you, the first thing you're gonna do is go home and Google diabetes and the top result is going to be the Wikipedia page on diabetes. And wouldn't it be nice if the information there actually were useful and helpful to you? And so in this course, graduate students sign up for credit. Uh, they work with this. It's taught by this faculty member, uh, Amin Azam. And they, uh, there's, some, there's a whole bunch of information here on the page. But you can see, for example, here are some of the topics. Uh, the last time you taught this class, the topics that they worked on. <laughs> I'm going to meander for just a moment here. It seems like hepatitis or white blood cells or alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And like the hepatitis article during that window was viewed 112,000 times. So you think about work that students do and the way that they think about the work that they're doing, that they know you're going to kind of half grade. Oh, I have to tell you this great story about my brother. I have to digress for a moment. I, I'm not going to tell you which brother or where he went to school, but one of my younger brothers has a, um, what, an, an ornery streak, I guess is what you say. <laughs> At any time he was asked to write something five pages or longer, somewhere in the middle of that essay, he would embed a brownie recipe. <laughs> with directions that say, if you will circle the recipe, I will bake these brownies and bring them to you. And I want you to know that in four years of school, never was the brownie recipe circle. Now, I, I think his, well, first of all, he's just a troublemaker. Um, and and I, I think to be able to get all the way through college without ever having somebody circle his, his brownie recipe is, uh, is a bit of an outlier. But I do think that students, I, I don't know how seriously students feel like we take their work. Um, whether we even can actually read all the words that they write or, or things like that. So the idea that now the, the, this, this work you're being asked to do, this essay that you're being asked to write, and not even to write from scratch, because there's already information about hepatitis on Wikipedia, you're being asked to go through and edit and improve and clarify and extend, that this writing that you do is going to be literally viewed 100,000 times maybe by people who just found out from their doctor that there's something in their life relating to this topic that should cause them to care deeply about this topic. Um, when students know that they're writing for the public, that they're writing on, uh, when the work that they're going to do might make a difference to someone, they engage in that work in a different way than they engage in work that they fully anticipate will be kind of two-thirds graded and then thrown away. Um, and so there's, uh, they, uh, Amin and, and the others who work on this project have written and published some articles um, about it, which if you look him up, you can find. And in the slides, which I'll share, is the link to the Wikipedia page here. But I just think this is such an interesting example of work that is really work that's worth doing. Lots of people go to Wikipedia for information. Um, and students really seem like they enjoy this work and get find more meaning in doing this kind of work, which of course is helping them learn more about hepatitis or white blood cells or whatever it is, is they do that research and they write things and then the faculty member, instead of just saying, well, I guess this is C work and handing it back to them, now it becomes more like of a article submission, review, resubmit, reworking kind of process. Uh, it, it's more meaningful for the faculty member as well. Everybody just invests in, in a different kind of way in this sort of work. So that's, that's a med school example. Um, I, want, I want to give you a couple of graduate students' examples. And we're, we're going to come kind of down the slope here all the way to middle school. 
is, is where we're going. <clears throat> um, I went through a, a phase in my kind of troubled young faculty years where I was really interested in wikis. And everything I did, there had to be some kind of wiki component to it. And one year I thought, you know what will what'll really blow kids' minds is I'm going to put the syllabus in a wiki. And when they come into class, I'm going to say, here's the syllabus, here's everything that's happening in the class. And you'll notice, with regard to our syllabus, this lovely edit tab at the top. And if you guys don't like something in the syllabus, the edit tab is right there. <laughs> Knock yourselves out. <laughs> um, you do need to understand that who makes what change is tracked, so I'll be able to see that it's you who changed it, but, you know, go to town. And my kind of assumption was that the grading scale would get changed so that from 2% to 100% was an A and 1% was a B. And, I mean, what, what do you think students would do given the opportunity to edit the official syllabus for your course? What, what do you think they'd do? Remove the exams. Re remove the exams, right? I mean, you start thinking, this is gonna be a complete disaster. What's gonna happen? Well, I, I, I taught this course one entire cycle without anybody making a single change to the syllabus, which is deeply disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first change that was ever made to this syllabus was this change, and it was students adding an assignment was the change that they made. Th this was a course, now this course is so old that this is when blogs and wikis were new media. Um, this is a course about, about new media and learning. And somebody, the, the assignment they've added here is let's demo, like let's stand up in class and teach each other like the core principles of blogging. Let's get these tools out and actually do hands-on walkthroughs about this and RSS and other things like that in the class. That's, that's the kind of change it turns out that they made. Like these assignments you're giving us aren't actually, they might be great for giving us grades, but they're not helping us learn. Wiley. <laughs> this assignment would be better. Um, so if, if you're humble enough to be able to eat that kind of feedback, it turns out to be good for everybody. If, if you're not humble enough to eat that feedback, it can be really problematic. Um, another course, you can tell I'm still in my wiki uh, phase here. This is a graduate seminar. Um, and the, the, the experience I wanted graduate students to have, which I realized I couldn't actually create, the experience I wanted them to have is I wanted them to, I wanted to get a conference room full of people with different expertise on this topic. And I wish students could just listen to them argue. Like I could, I could say, here's the topic I want you people to argue about. You argue, and graduate students, you take in all the different perspectives and angles on, on these issues that we're talking about. And I realized, you know, I, I knew I couldn't make that happen. But I had, this whole thing is a sequence of just terrible ideas. I had the terrible idea in this case so what would be really fun would be to spend my summer writing a sitcom, essentially, where every week's reading material was the conversation that I wish students had been able to hear from the experts arguing these different perspectives. And so, I don't know if this is big enough for you to read, but there, you know, <coughs> every character here has a name that relates to their kind of expertise. So R is Rita, the researcher, and O is Oscar, the open source zealot, and D is Danny, the software developer. Anyway, I, just, I, you know, I sat down and I wrote these kinds of conversations between them that got the kinds of issues and perspectives out that I wanted students to, to hear and think about and consider. And since at this point I'm putting everything in the wiki, I put my sitcom in the wiki. I have to tell you, my wife thought that was crazy. My wife would walk past my office and I'd be just laughing hysterically. She'd stick her head in and say, what's going on? Like, what are you laughing about? And I'll say, oh, you won't believe the thing that Rita just did in her <laughs> class. And she's like, you're writing, Rita. You can't find it that funny. You can't be surprised by what your own character is saying. It turns out you can't. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I threw this on the wiki. And I thought, I'm sure I've made spelling errors. I've had, there are punctuation problems with this, I know. Because I'm just writing it kind of really, really fast over the summer. I'll throw it in the wiki. And maybe as students see those things, they'll be annoyed by them. They'll hit edit. And they'll help, help clean up the text. So I wrote it over the summer, and then during the school year, you know, over the weekend before we were about to deal with another topic, I'd go through and read what I had written to remind myself of the specifics of what we're supposed to talk about. And the third or fourth weekend of the course, I went in to read what I had written, and there was a new character in my sitcom. <laughs> uh, Tina, the teacher, the, the public school teacher, had shown up for one of our little conversations uh, because 
one of the students in the class thought there was an important kind of K-12 perspective on the issue that was being talked about that day, and I hadn't covered it, and there's an edit tab there, and why not? So Tina starts showing up. She doesn't show up every week, but whenever there's something kind of important for a, a, an important public school perspective to be reflected, she shows up. And, and this leads me, you know, this students adding assignments to the syllabus when I give them permission to, to edit the syllabus or students writing new characters in when I think what I'm giving them is permission to essentially make the writing less annoying, to make the writing better, kind of started to create in me the sense that when you make things open, when you give people copyright permissions, so of course these wikis are, this is all openly licensed, the syllabus is openly licensed, the, the contents of this whole uh, book are openly licensed. When you give them permission to do things, students will never do the things that you think they're going to do. But they will always do something more awesome than what you imagine they are going to do. And so I've, I've come to this kind of credo that openness facilitates the unexpected. <laughs> And if you can be cool with that, there's a lot of really amazing stuff that can happen in your class if you don't, if you don't have to be kind of a dictator about everything that happens. If you create some open spaces, students will do really interesting things. Uh, let me show you a couple of other examples here real quickly. So as I went on, um, you know, I guess this one, strictly speaking, wasn't a bad idea. This is just me being lazy, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, I used to teach a course when I was still full-time called Project Management for Instructional Designers. There is no textbook called Project Management for Instructional Designers. This course is taught 70 places around the country. It's taught in graduate programs on educational technology, which is the, the kind of program I used to teach in. And I really only wanted to use OER in this course, of, of course, because I'm, I'm all about OER and been committed to that for 19 years now. And uh, I was bemoaning to a faculty colleague that I'd found this collection of OER that was almost perfect. It was, it, was, it was a whole textbook worth of material on project management, but it was written for the business school. So all the examples were wrong, all the case studies were wrong, the assessments used language that my students either wouldn't know or wouldn't care about. And, um, you know, darn, I came so close to finding what I needed when my colleague kind of just intellectually backhanded me and said, it's open, change it into the book you need it to be. That's, isn't that what you're always talking about? Isn't that the whole point of open? But it was just so much work that it never occurred to me to try to take it on. And so as I was kind of licking my wounds after being hit with my own definition of open being thrown back at me, I realized the, the smart play here is not for me to do it. It's to do it collaboratively with the students, have the students do the work of turning this book into the book that it needs to be. And so, um, you know, over the, there's a little description here at the top. Over the years, the, the students have made a lot of changes to this book. Um, but this, this is a required course that nobody really was excited about taking in our program. Um, and so one of the things I would do on the very first day is tell them there's a thing called uh, the project management professional certification, the PMP certification. And the mean salary for a person holding this uh, certification is $106,000 a year. Then for about 30 minutes, everybody was interested. In class, right? um, but it turns out that you can't use this book to actually prepare for the exam. And the exam prep books are like GRE or LSAT prep books. They're these giant paperback, really bad quality, kind of production quality books that cost hundreds of dollars. So one group of students said, hey, you know what we want to do? Because I, basically on the first day of class, I explained to them what was going on and that their task for the semester is going to be to break into groups and improve the book in some way. And they had proposed those improvements to, we, to me, and we'd negotiate those, and I'd accept them, and then they'd make a series of improvements to the book over the course. So they said, we want to take this book, and we want to reorganize it and add kind of some structural information and things so that you can use this freely available book to prep for the PMP. We want to turn this free book into uh, an exam prep book. So that happened. Um, one group of students who was really interested in video and shooting video and editing video said, you know, the little case studies that, that are in here are fine, but we think, I mean, it's the internet. 
it doesn't just have to be words. We will go. Well, we we will find a couple of people whose job is project managing, instructional design kind of projects like building online courses, for example, and we'll shoot a series of interviews with them where we'll ask them questions about the topic of each chapter, and we'll you know we'll negotiate those questions with you. We'll work together on those, and then we'll edit that video down, and we'll embed these video case studies in each chapter in the book. So one group of people did that. Um, one of the things that we did to the book that wasn't, uh, I guess, particularly interesting was making it available in multiple formats here. Um, but also, going, there was one, the very first semester I taught it, one group went through and pulled out every little yellow box that had an example in it about uh, the logistics of making sure that all the rebar and all the concrete arrive at Singapore at the same time so that the construction project can get going. They just went through and pulled out every one of those and wrote new, kind of, what do you say, thematically appropriate case studies. And um, you know, the, the amount of effort that they put into this work is really kind of uh, is really kind of amazing. For many for many reasons, and part of it part of it is the open part of it, and part of it's just the public part of it. When, when they're doing work that they know is going to be seen and used by other people, and particularly when they know they're going to have to stand up in class in front of their peers in their weekly report out and show the status of their work, it very quickly becomes a situation where nobody wants to be embarrassed by how shoddy their work is. Everybody wants to be the cleverest or do the funniest or the smartest kind of thing. And this frequently friendly kind of competition emerges among the groups as to who can make the most useful contribution to the book. Um, I ask these students at the end of the term, I always ask them, you know, tell me, tell me about your grade in this class. Tell me how concerned you were about your grade. And they say, oh, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I assume we're all going to get A's in this class because we're all working our butts off. So I guess I never really thought about what my grade was going to be. And then I would always follow that up by asking them, how much time did you spend working on this course relative to every other course you took? And then you can see their face kind of, the re you see the realization happen that they've been snookered somehow. <laughs> that they spent so much more time on this class than they did any other class, but there was no point at which they were worried about their grade. Why would I work if I'm not worried about my grade? Like you just see them processing all this, trying to figure out why did I spend all this time when it wasn't for a grade? What was I doing? It's a really beautiful moment to watch, uh, to watch happen for them. Uh, I, I, I want to show you a couple of brief videos. Uh, of student work here. One, one, of, one of the funnest, um, funnest, most fun <laughs> English majors, um, English faculty. But one of the most fun assignments that I've, uh, I've done is what I call my kung fu assignment. And any kung fu fans, like old Jackie Chan, like the good stuff, Fantasy Mission Force, or any of the, um, the for me, the, the kind of defining feature, at least of the English version of those films, is that the audio is never in sync with what's happening on the screen. Like the person's mouth moves, and then the English comes in like two seconds later. It's really, that's it, it, part of the charm of those, those older kung fu movies. So anyway, the point of the kung fu assignment is to go find some openly licensed video uh, or some public domain video where there are no copyright restrictions and you have those 5R permissions and recreate the audio for that video to make the video serve a new purpose. And so again, this is, um, this is from that new media class, uh, new media and learning class that I taught. And this, in another version of this class, would have been a two-page compare and contrast, what do blogs and wikis have in common, what's different about blogs and wikis. But turn this into the Kung Fu assignment, and I um, just want to share with you an example of how that turned out uh, here. Let's see if I have audio. <coughs> Some but this is about four minutes long, but I'm just going to let it roll. As web communication and collaboration tools evolve, the distinction between wikis and blogs has become subtle at the outset and greater as the use deepens. Like Watch this and keep snapping back. Blogs and wikis might video. not seem that different on first glance because they, they both enable yeah. communication of information by a person or group of people and provide a platform for feedback. Blogs do it in the form of comments, while wikis do it by letters, letting users directly edit the content of a given 
page. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get to the heart of the matter. Wikis are indeed what our people need at this crucial time in the history of our nation. The, the, the accents are the worst, right? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I disagree, Mr. Kennedy. Blogs are the way of the future for this nation. A few weeks ago, I created a blog entitled The Watergate Blog. Now, the good thing about these blogs is that you can control the information that's available to the people in the media. You can also keep away internet predators, where a wiki without the proper controls can be very susceptible through their evil ploys. <laughs> Something my esteemed opponent has failed to disclose to the American people is that wikis are particularly susceptible to the evils of internet predators. Anyone going in and editing the text has, that is viewed by the children of this nation. In contrast, a blog you can clearly see who said what without compromising the integrity of the content. Furthermore, any comments or postings can be screened by the blog facilitator, and I say to the American people, let me be your blog facilitator. <laughs> well, I respect the views of my worthy opponent, Mr. Nixon. They are utterly unconstitutional. The aforementioned openness of a wiki is a great example of the freedom of speech that we get from a wiki. The voice of the people should not be suppressed. Not only are blogs rigid, but they are unconstitutional in that they do not allow for freedom of speech. Mr. Nixon, how do you answer to recently publicized charges that you pay people to put positive comments on your blog? <laughs> I am not a crook to play this game. What about the scandalous and inappropriate comments reported to be found on your wiki, Mr. Kennedy? While the voice of the people should certainly not be suppressed. Any comment found on your site can be seen as something you support. But do you, the American people, want that content to be identified as something as you support? Do you want to open your beliefs, your convictions, and have them to be at the mercy of the critical masses? Now we know what you think of the American people, Mr. Nixon. <laughs> Any final comments, Mr. Kennedy? In closing, I want the people of this nation to know that with a wiki, your voice will be heard. I will ensure that everyone has access to every wiki. Let me be the warrior of your wiki. Ask not what your wiki can do for you, but what you can do for your wiki. <laughs> Okay, so, so you can see the amount of work that's gone into this, right? Searching or like digging through all this old video, trying to find some like, what really exempt? What's the what's the core difference between a blog and a wiki? You can see the students are really kind of getting down and figuring out. Kennedy's call: ask not what your wiki can do for you, but what you can do for you. that. There is no single sentence you could create that better describes what's powerful and what's terrible about wikis, right? It, um, it's just, this example is just beautiful on so many levels. Um, and I think, oh, maybe I've, where is it? Maybe it's because I'm in dark uh, mode here. I've switched over to nighttime mode. But th this video has been, oh no, there it is. It's right here. I pull this up. This piece of homework has been viewed, ah, 57,000 times. This video has been viewed right down here, right below the title. Um, you know, so, and if you if you go like search for a difference between blogs and wikis or blogs versus wikis or something like that on YouTube, this will be one of the, on Google, this will be one of the top results that comes up. Uh, for me, when I search, it's number three. Um, so this is student work that could have been a throwaway piece of work, just a compare and contrast kind of something but that they got really into, they invested a lot of effort in, it turned out to be really fun, and it's had an impact outside the classroom. Um, I'll show you one, one additional example that's shorter, but that I think in some ways shows even more creativity on the part of the students. 
because these students managed to find a video that they could leave in large sections of the original audio and still make it work to, to their, uh, toward their end. So this, is a vi this video is targeted toward people who work in the K-12 context that are thinking about using blogs and wikis in their class, but maybe they haven't stopped to consider the policies that their school district might have and student privacy and, and data protection and things like that around the work that they're trying to do. And I'll, I'll ask you at the end what you think this old PSA was originally about. But, uh, but here we go. experimenting with something he knows little about, about which too little is known by anyone. It's a scene which must have been, in countless ways, all equally heartbreaking, the father-son confrontation. Have you really considered all the consequences? Like many who dabble with blogs and wikis, Tom did not consider his own school district policy on their use. These policies are usually administered by the district cabinet. Each district is different, but many districts block all outside blog and wiki software on the internet because of internet safety rules. Anyway, Tom, it is illegal. What it really does is it is expands your mind. It makes you see things more clearly. It makes you more creative. In some cases, if a district employee finds that a blog or wiki is blocked, and they wish to use it, they can request that it be opened. When a teacher requests to use a blog or wiki for teaching, Sometimes the tech department will recommend that one be set up internally that can be used only within the district. Two viewpoints, two opinions. But the relationship between Tom and his father is basically a good one. Tom's father believes in his son, and he challenges him, find out the actual facts. Most districts already have web servers, and many have blogs and wikis currently in use that keep students safe from internet predators. Before using a blog or wiki in your classroom, check your district policies and be sure to keep your students safe from internet predators. You think we're stupid, and you're right. But does that make your generation so all fired smart? <laughs> anyway, so you get the uh, you, you get the idea. You know, again, this could have been a typical kind of writing assignment or make five slides and stand up in front of the class and give a presentation about it. Um, but this kind of work that can be openly licensed, that can go out into YouTube and have a life of its own that other people can watch, other people can use in their classrooms. And because it's open, they can take and build on it to do additional things. Um, that, and, and some of these are even other blogs and the juvenile delinquent. This is another from, from this class that, that we won't watch right now. But, uh, they, they just engage in this work in a different kind of way and have a different kind of feeling about how important it is and how good a job they want to do. Um, but it still is coming through and expressing these kind of key, key pieces of things that we want to make sure that they understand. And they want to make sure they understand them too, especially if they're putting out their understanding in public. They want to make sure that it's right. So that's, that's a couple words about graduate students. Uh, a couple, just a couple more examples and then we'll get to some conversation here. Um, in the undergraduate context, there's a great project uh, that began its life up at University of British Columbia called Murder, Madness, and Mayhem. Th this one's quite old. Does anybody know this project, just by chance? Um, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem was a course, uh, an upper level Spanish course, Spanish uh, 312, uh, about kind of lesser known Latin American authors. And most of the authors that are read in this class were sufficiently obscure that the English language Wikipedia didn't even have an entry for them. And so the goal for students in this class, in addition to doing the readings and engaging in the class conversation, the written assignment in this class was to go create a brand new Wikipedia page for the author that your, your group is assigned to and make that page so high quality as judged by the rest of the Wikipedia community that it gets rated as a, a featured article. 
Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the way uh, that articles are quality rated inside Wikipedia, but featured articles are articles that actually appear on the front page. Like if you just type in wikipedia.org and you go to the front page of Wikipedia, every day there's an article featured there. And so it gets an incredible amount uh, of views. And in this class, there are actually three articles written by these students over the semester that reached featured article status that were prominently displayed on the homepage of Wikipedia for a full day. Um, and then several articles that got good article ratings uh, and one that never really got above B class article. But again, same kind, of, same kind of idea here. Students are doing work, they're doing writing that they know isn't just gonna get thrown away. They're writing about these authors to provide information to the English language, the English speaking public that does not exist. There just were no pages for these authors in Wikipedia. So they're not doing work that's gonna get thrown away. They're doing work that's gonna be seen by others. And as it goes into Wikipedia, it's gonna be extended and built on by others over time. Um, the, the last undergraduate example that I'll share here is the, uh, the Open Anthology of Early American Literature. This is Rob, uh, Robin DeRosa's work. And essentially what she's done here, she's taken what would have been um, like one of those Norton anthologies that has, in the case of early American literature, every piece of literature in that book is in the public domain. It's out of copyright. And students pay $110 or something for these collections of freely available uh, piece, works of literature, and what are they paying for? They're paying for the kind of historical context, the questions to think about, that kind of wraparound material that goes around those readings. And so what Robin did was she worked with a couple of classes of students to reproduce all of that introductory historical context, wraparound content, and you know, it's assignments that students are doing, and she's grading and revising, and they're going through a process working with that, but uh, up to the point now that they're able to actually completely replace that uh, anthology they've previously been using with uh, work done by, uh, the work is high enough quality done by those students that in future classes now, students use this instead of using work. So they've been able to, to switch that out completely. Um, now let me share one middle school and high school example and then I'll, I'll be done with examples here. Um, and I'm sorry to hit you with so many of them, but I think just talking about in the abstract doesn't really, you can't really get it in the abstract. You have to see examples of how it works. So this is from an article, oh, this says forthcoming, but it actually just got published earlier this week. Um, the, the context uh, for this particular piece of research is this uh, school called Mountain Heights Academy, which is an online public uh, charter school in Utah, whose charter documents prohibit it from ever adopting any commercial curriculum. The, the charter school is an experiment to see to what degree could you run an entire school on open educational resources. So you can see it's about 600 full-time, 200 part-time students at grades seven through 12. And the, the kind of, the, the reason we did this study was twofold. As, as first, in the past, as I've talked about, this kind of question of what can you do in the context of open that you can't do in other contexts people frequently would raise their hand and say, well, yeah, you teach graduate students, so of course your students are capable of working at this high level, but I teach undergrads, or I teach at this community college, or I teach in this other context where I could never ask my students to do that, it just wouldn't work. So now when I give this presentation, you know, I go from medical school all the way down to undergrads, and now we're gonna go down into high school and middle school just to make this point that yes, every student, every group of students that you work with can do this kind of work given the right kind of opportunity. They're capable of way more than we imagine they're capable of when they're given the right sorts of opportunities. But the other was I wanted to look very specifically at this question of when students create OER and we use those OER to teach students that come later on, what actually happens to student learning? Like it's great to get students involved in creating OER and everything, but if it, if, if the next generation of students can't learn as much as the, the ones that came before, that's bad and nobody wants to do that regardless of how cool it is. <clears throat> so what we did here was uh, the study looked at a course on digital photography uh, in, in two time periods separated by four years. And over that four year period, the teacher remained the same, the course remained the same, the assignments remained the same, the grading rubrics for the assignments remained the same. And what changed over that period was that every year that this course was taught, students had an opportunity, 
either for extra credit or uh, TAs who had taken the course and succeeded before and were now TAing the course to create OER that the faculty member would evaluate and if it met her quality threshold, she would incorporate it into the course. So this course went from having no student created OER to being about 10% student created OER over a four, period, or a four year period of time. Uh, and then we just wanted to look and see with everything else staying the same, the assignments stable, the rubrics stable, the teacher stable, the rest of the content stable, uh, you know, what kind of change might have happened in student learning that we might associate with the creation of all this uh, student-generated OER. So the kinds of OER that students generated, uh, some of them were just really simple things like, here's a chapter outline or a chapter summary, or here is a, uh, here's kind of an explainer blog post with directions about go here, click this, then click that, then to tell people like how to share their photos online. Or videos that students made, that to, like little three minute video tutorials about depth of field or how to edit a portrait or how to use this piece of software called the GIMP, which is open source software, kind of like Photoshop, but turns out to be a little more complicated to use than Photoshop. So creating, you know, creating video tutorials for each other, uh, practice games, things like that. And, and what we found, um, you know, the, so the kind of left-hand column here, 2011, 2012 to 2014, 2015, just looking at the kind of scores that students received on these assignments, and in the far right hand side, you can see the, the, the kind of t-tests and statistical significance here that about, about half of the assignments, there is actually a, a significant difference in the kinds of grades that students are receiving. They're, they're positive. There are some assignments down here toward the bottom where the student grades were decreasing, but those didn't turn out to be statistically significant. But taken in aggregate, when you look at the bottom overall, there's like an eight point difference in the grades that students are getting on these assignments, which is significant. And the only difference between the first group and the second group is that the second group had the opportunity to use OER created by other students. So, you know, we, we've seen lots of examples of students creating OER, and now we have at least one data point. Obviously, this isn't an end to the conversation or an end to the research that's needed, but one data point showing that when students are creating OER and we're providing those OER to other students, that they can have a positive impact on student learning. So that's important. Um, two quick slides worth of practical considerations. As you think about engaging in this kind of work yourself, as you think about what kinds of renewable assignments could I provide in my own class. Um, the, the first two points I think that are really important are first, talking to your students about open licensing and about what that means. <coughs> and second, understanding that you cannot require your students to openly license their material. You can't dictate to them the terms under which they will release to the world their own work. You can explain open licensing to them, tell them why it's good, tell them how it will expand the kind of impact of the time that they're going to spend doing that work. But at the end of the day, it's their choice whether they want to openly license it or not. And for those that don't, you need to provide them with some alternative way to do work and submit work and still earn a grade in your, in your class. The, the same way that, uh, you know, if you think about this from an IRB perspective, that you have to provide alternatives for people who want to opt out. Um, I think there's a great opportunity here for us to talk to students about the idea of their identity online, their digital identity, and who they are and how they perform that identity publicly um, as they're taking work that they're doing that might be creative, might be clever, might be boring, might be dull, might be on a topic that they actually don't care about, but they had this assignment to do it. How do they want those works associated with them out on the internet? publicly, as people search for them and they find that work. What does that mean? How does that shape the way that other people think about who they are? And then you have to be clear about the guidelines for what OER you're going to choose to merge into the course going forward, and what work students will get credit for, but that might not make the threshold of actually being good enough that you want to expose other students to it in the future. Um, I have some experience early on not being clear with those criteria, and then students do a lot of work thinking with the guarantee that their work is going to make its way into the textbook for the course, and then they're upset when it, when it doesn't. Um, you know, this raises questions about keeping the OER that you create and you use for your course outside the LMS. Um, 
Now it can be outside the LMS and inside the LMS at the same time with like LTI integrations or things like that. Talk to your instructional technologists here about that, um, about how that can work. Man managing attribution, when you're pulling student work into a course, they need credit. All of the Creative Commons licenses require that you provide credit back to the person who's the author of the work that you're using in exchange for permission to make those uses of it. And then the, the, the final one that I'll say something about here is just time, time, time. This, this as a faculty member, it's, it's almost kind of dangerous because this work is so fun and the students are doing stuff that's so clever that you want to engage with it in a different way. It can actually, if you don't manage your own kind of time carefully, it can eat into your time in ways that keep you from being able to get other stuff done. So, um, so be thoughtful about managing your time there. I'm going to skip that last point because I want to get to conversation. So I think really it's just about being kind of curious pedagogically. Like what, what are the sets of teaching and learning things that I can do in the context of the five hour activities I couldn't do before? And how might those transform your own practice and how might they transform student learning? I think those are super interesting and, and hope now to have a, a bit of a conversation about that. And I think there's even a, another mic to, to run around. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Hey. I feel like for some students, they're really hungry for, for this change in paradigm with the course. And some students, it's really uncomfortable for mm -hmm. them to, because you're the authority and you tell them you know, what to do. So I feel like there might be this a missing piece of community. Like, what do you do? You obviously do something. This works in your classes. So what do you do to um, let students feel comfortable, maybe show vulnerability, but for them to mm. get comfortable with this change? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's a good question. I, um, so just taking a moment to reflect on that. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things I do in my class uh, to try, I, so rolling back just a little bit. When I was younger, I spent a couple of years living in Japan. And in, um, in Japanese, whenever you speak to someone, you have many choices of how you can conjugate your verbs. And, and the type of verb that you use and the way you choose to conjugate it is a very clear statement about the social relationship between you and the person that you're speaking to. You can speak up to people who are higher or better than you, you can speak to peers, and you can speak down to people who are your inferiors or even down even further, like to a pet or something. So I, I, I know that I'm really highly sensitized to the way that language kind of reifies these power dynamics. Um, and so I, I do have some rules in my class, like I, I will not respond to Dr. Wiley. And I, I explained that on the first day, like there's one person in the world who gets to call me Dr. Wiley, it's my mom, and it's because I can't make her stop because she's my mom. <laughs> and she's super proud that I'm Dr. Wiley. And if, if you don't call me David, I'm just going to ignore you until you get the point and remember to call me David. Because I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's helpful to, it, it's already, it's already obvious in a hundred other ways that I have expertise in, in whatever the class content is, and they don't. Everything I can do to try to help them realize that I'm just another human being who's out of school a couple years ahead of you. I've had the chance to learn this already. You haven't. But we're all just trying to kind of get through this together, and I expect you to be co-creating and adding actual value to what's happening in this class in the same way that I'm trying to. And yes, I'm... I'm to use Vygotsky's language, maybe I'm a more capable peer. But I really do want them to feel like they can say stupid things, they can come up to me, like they can tell me what's going on in their life, they can say, my mom got sick in this way, or my car did this. Well, I, I want to be able to have those relationships with them, um, which gets difficult to scale when, you have, when you're dealing with a lot of students, admittedly. Um, but I just think there's there's a ton of power in creating a space where everybody feels like we're going to work our butts off, but we're going to have fun doing it. And if we're not having fun, we're probably doing it wrong. And if we're not exhausted, we're probably doing it wrong. Um, because I, 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 I think as a faculty member, if you don't love 
your discipline enough that other people, that there's at least possibility for other people to have some fun engaging with you around your own discipline, that there are broader problems, right, that, that just simple changes to pedagogy aren't going to solve. But I think there are things that you can do in the classroom. Uh, the, the, the one that's coming to my mind right now is this, this kind of carefulness around the way that I talk to students and have them talk to me. Um, BYU has a, this great system uh, where in, our, uh, in the SIS, when I, when I go through to see who is enrolled for the class, like, you know, to see the class roster, there's a button I can push to generate a set of flashcards with students' faces and names on them so that I can actually learn their names and who they are. And I will tell you, it, it's, it's, hard, it, it's hard to quantify the impact of students walking through the door on the very first day of class and they don't know you from Adam to greet them by name as they come through the door. You can't do it to everybody, right? I mean, you just can't remember, you can't learn all those names that quickly. Um, but it's, it's just, there are things that we do to invest in the teaching. And it takes time away from the research, it takes time away from the grant writing, you know, but it makes the teaching better. And so I, I think there are things like that that you can do to create an environment where people feel like you care and it's okay and they can call you by your first name, maybe. And, and, and there's, depending on the culture that students come from, there are some students who really struggle with that. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's things like that that you do to try to help students understand that you're here to teach and they're here to learn. And you're still learning about, I hope you're still learning about your discipline too. Like if you've stopped learning about your discipline, that's bad. They need to see that you're still learning and you're all on this kind of learning thing together. And, I do think you have to create some sense of that in them to get them to really open up. And I do think it's also a good idea to show fun examples of things students have done in the past to help them understand that when I say renewable assignments, I don't mean I'm going to write the same boring essay I used to write, but now I'm going to put an open license on it. Right? Like there's more fun to be had here. There's more cleverness and creativity to be engaged here than I ever thought there might be. Oh, and he might reward me for that. Right, so I, I, I think this is a really, really important kind of topic that you dialed in on here, but there are absolutely ways to do it. Can be done. Yeah. Hi, um, I love these ideas about pedagogy, and <clears throat> I teach online, and I hope to continue to use OER, but I have kind of a grim question. So I'm. I'll give you a grim answer. Okay, <laughs> I'm 43. I'm right in the middle of Generation X. Um, I have. I'm 45. Okay, it's awesome. the hair. <laughs> um, most everyone I know owes quite a bit on student loans. When I think about the concept of creating, spending time and investing in creating a textbook, I love the idea in theory, but I think about the opportunity cost of mm -hmm. the extreme debt I have, and most everyone I know and millennials in the same boat. So this kind of structural problem of um, student loan debt I'm, I'm pretty much giving money away when I create major content. I do create content, but I love to do it. I create yeah. YouTube videos and whatnot, and it's, it's good. But when I think about spending hundreds of hours creating a textbook, I can't do that. I can't afford to do yeah, that. Don't, don't do that. So how do we encourage this sort of uh, practice while many of us are, are you know, have this albatross of uh, debt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great, great question. Um, I, I think the first thing to, to realize or understand or something is that engaging with OER isn't about every person who teaches introduction to psychology sitting down and spending 300 hours writing another introduction to psychology textbook from scratch or another abnormal textbook from scratch. We need 10 or 15 of those. And one of them is going to be within striking distance of what you want it to be. And then the question is, how do you get it from there kind of over the finish line, right? And, um, and if you are going to do, if you do find yourself in a situation where there's just literally OER, then you need a grant. You know, then you, then you need to be kind of compensated either with release time or with cash or something else to go spend 100 hours doing something. But I, I think the thing about renewable assessments is students already spend all this time. You already have some block of time committed to grading. Is there a way that together you can spend that time that you already spend creating OER that can be useful, that can be improved by the next set of students later on. It's, it's not about 
where do I find more time in my day? Because I'm already totally taxed with my teaching load and my research and whatever. Plus, I have this student loan debt payment. It, it's about how can I take the time that my students and I are already spending, how can we use that time together in these ways? And it, if it happens that you're in a discipline where there's not a core of good existing OER already, then talk to Michelle, look for other opportunities to find other faculty to collaborate with. Maybe you can't, don't write a whole book, but maybe you can write a chapter. And maybe at your annual professional association meeting, you can meet up with some of the people who went to grad school with who teach in the same discipline who they each be willing to write one chapter. And maybe over a year, you can pull something together in a pretty lightweight way that can be something that could replace a textbook if it got some additional work done to it by students. Or there, there are kind of creative ways to make that happen. But uh, please don't take away the message that OER is about finding hundreds of additional hours in your life where there's a high opportunity cost of not spending that time in some other way. Because that, that's not the message. The message is there's a lot of good work that's already been done that you should try to leverage and reuse. And you can repurpose your existing time commitments and your students' time commitments in more productive ways. Does that make sense? It does. I just see a lot of the textbooks more geared for first year, second year courses. I'm in mm -hmm. teacher education and there's mm -hmm. almost nothing. Yeah. So, I mean literally nothing. I'm in literacy teacher education and there's pretty much zero mm -hmm except government written documents. Yeah, yeah so I, I think you're looking for a collaboration opportunity or a grant or a collaborative grant opportunity. And there's no need to feel guilty or bad or something else about not adopting OER when OER don't exist, right? You, you can wish you could use them, but if they're not there, uh, until they get there, don't like lie in bed and think, oh, why am I using OER? Right? If they're not there, you can't adopt them. Yeah. Hi, David. I'm Jody Bailey. I work here at the libraries as the director of publishing and work with Michelle. Um, I wanted to uh, play off of Peggy's comment by giving a shout out to the Rebus community and yeah. the great work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, in case you don't know that um, it's a community of scholars who are getting together and doing exactly what David described. Yeah. Collaborative um, textbook authoring. Collaborative textbook authoring. And I know that they're working on a philosophy book right now. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what else, but that there's Peggy, additional work I mean, that done. might be a really great opportunity for you to bring up with that community that this is a real gap that, that you see, right? Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was actually a question, and that is, um, how do you approach that really um, sensitive part of the work that you do with students where you're assessing their work, and you, you briefly mentioned it, but I'd like for you to go into more detail on it, when their, their work isn't quite good enough to be sort of ready for prime time, right? Um, maybe you're working with a class who's doing the very first iteration on a brand new OER, mm -hmm. and it's just like none of it is really good enough that year, but maybe the next year it might mm -hmm. be, you know, by, by the next year's students it might be made that much better, and maybe by the third or fourth year it might be better. So how do you talk to those early students who are working on the very first iterations that that just aren't there yet. Yeah. Um, well, you know, part of the, the time management piece of that is, I, I think it takes a really special circumstance to be able to use this kind of assignment for all of your assignments. Generally, you're gonna pick one or two assignments and replace them with an assignment like this because of the, the kind of time commitment. Um, unless, like, like that example of the project management for instructional designers book, that book was already fine in terms of accuracy. It was just, it wasn't localized, right? right. So, so that was a, a localization task, really, that, that did let us have all the assignments be about, about localizing the content every week. Um, I think you have to be clear in your rubric, well, I, I now know, you have to be clear in your rubric about you know, how far the work has to get for students to be able to receive the, the credit and the grade that they want, and how much further it has to go to actually get included in the core materials. And, I'm maybe, if I haven't said anything kind of controversial yet, maybe this will be the controversial thing that I'll say. There are students who end up in classes that are, have a kind of C's get degrees attitude. It's not a class in their major, it's something they're required to take to fill a requirement or something. And a C is all they want. Right. And a C is all they need. And God bless them. Let them earn their C and kind of go on their way spend their time on the thing that they do love and that they do, they do want to spend their life doing. And if, the, if they don't want to put in the extra work to get it over the line to where it gets included in the course, 
uh, the course materials, just be clear in the rubric about you know, this is a C, this is a B, this is an A, this goes into the into the materials later on. And if you're interested in your stuff going into next year's materials, make sure you tell me that when you submit your work so that I can engage with you with it in that way instead of just grading it in, in a more kind of traditional kind of way. But I think, man, it, you know the way that, that, that students come in and want to argue about an individual answer to an individual item, an individual, like the rules matter to them and clarity matters and ambiguity is, is bad, right? So every, everything that you can do to kind of differentiate between here's what you have to do just to earn a grade, here's the additional piece that needs to happen in order for you to kind of achieve memorialization in the next version of the book or whatever, and just let them make that call. Like, if they don't care about economics, but they're in this course because they need something, you know, for their gen ed requirement, whatever, get that grade that you want and, and keep moving forward. You know, and just give them the information and let them make the choice. Um, but if if you're if you're unclear about that early on, about how it's going to work and what's going on, then which you probably will be, you will not be sufficiently clear the first time you do it. E even even as you try to be clear, you'll learn things the first one or two or three times. You know, anytime you do something new, you, you never get it exactly right the first time. So there is a bit of a willingness on your part too to maybe your teaching reviews this year are going to be 5.1 instead of 5.4 or, or something like that. But it's an investment, you know, over time in, in, in making it better. And you have to be. I mean, it's easier if you're tenured. If you're not tenured, then you need to have a supportive committee who understands what you're trying to do and things like that. Thanks. Yeah. I think we have time for one or maybe two more questions. Have you ever had? Uh, but we're, we're you have to. We, we need have, to get you recorded for. Uh, have you ever area. had a bad experience with content that got out that was maybe plagiarized or in some other way that was not properly cited and that caused you problems? And what did you do? Um, so no. But because I'm pretty, I'm pretty careful uh, about that. Now, I, I, I'll treat the work that I'm considering moving into the core instructional materials that are going to get shared out. I'll, I'll treat that differently than other student work. Um, but if there's some work that looks like it's really good and I'm thinking about putting it in, then I'll, I'll take text selections out of it and put them into Google. I'll take the images out and use Google image search. I'll do the kind of things that we do to check for plagiarism. The, the, the core underlying principle of the Creative Commons licenses is that you're given these 5R permissions under certain conditions. Oh, that actually rhymes, doesn't it? I don't think I ever realized that rhymed before. But the, uh, there are six Creative Commons licenses, but every one of them has as a condition that you provide appropriate attribution to the original author. And if you don't provide that appropriate attribution, you actually don't have permission to engage in any of those activities. So, now you're not just plagiarizing, you're also breaking copyright because you don't have any of those five, permission to engage in those five R activities. So when I talk with students at the beginning about open licensing and about this is the, for some of you who will be interested in your work moving into the kind of core material in this way, this is something that you need to pay attention to. I actually talk them, I'll take half a class period and go through just open licensing and help them understand what that means. Um, and I don't know if it's that I'm, particularly careful or that I beat it into them, but I actually haven't had a problem where somebody, you know, some third parties come back and said, your student did this and it violated my copyright and it needs to be taken down and maybe that'll happen to me at some point in the future, but I actually haven't had that experience yet. But I, I think if you, if you sufficiently kind of drill it into them about the importance of attribution and the kind of whole culture of openness and sharing and giving credit to each other and you getting the credit that you want when other people use your, if you, if you kind of bring them into that community a little bit and then let them know that you're gonna be checking and that that's gonna be very bad for their grade if it turns out that something like that has gone on. It's, it's some of the normal stuff that you do already because um, you, now you're building on top of your institution's pledges and policy with another layer, right? Um, I don't know, it hasn't been a problem for me then it's probably not a super helpful answer. It'd be more helpful if there had been a problem and I could tell you what I did, but hasn't been one yet. And we are out of time. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us.